Hi friends! I'm excited to be back talking about testosterone for women again. It's been a little while since we talked about testosterone, but I wanted to share some really interesting facts about testosterone for women that people don't know about very much, and certainly doctors don't know about very much, including me. And one of them is this really surprising fact that testosterone, not estradiol, is actually the predominant sex hormone that's circulating in women's bloodstreams when we're young and healthy. So I was taught, possibly like you, that women didn't have testosterone at all, or if they did, it certainly wasn't important, that estrogen was the primary hormone and testosterone, if it was there, was at very low levels. Well, here's the truth. We actually make five to 10 times more testosterone throughout our lives than estradiol, which is so fascinating because if you look at a lab slip, just say you get your blood drawn, you're going to see numbers that suggest that testosterone is quite a bit lower than estradiol. And that is because the units of measurement are completely different. So it's something interesting that doctors are not taught, but the units of measurement obviously make a huge difference. So just for example, if you get a blood test for testosterone, that is measured in units called picograms per milliliter. And estradiol, on the other hand, is measured in a different unit altogether called nanograms per deciliter. So it's really comparing apples and oranges. To make those equal up, you actually have to multiply the testosterone by 10, which is fascinating, isn't it? So if you're looking at numbers, just say you get your blood drawn, I'm just gonna make up some easy numbers, and your testosterone is 40, and your estradiol is 80. I'm just making up random numbers. That could be a very normal blood test for a perimenopausal woman, for example. Well, because they're different units of measurement, to make them equal, you'd have to multiply the testosterone by 10. So in that scenario, the testosterone would actually be 400 compared to 80 if you're comparing apples to apples. So if we look at the actual amount of testosterone that we make as women throughout our lives, it's about five to 10 times more than estradiol. So it is true to say that in women as well as men, that testosterone is actually the primary circulating sex hormone when we're young and healthy. And of course, for both men and women, as we know, it drops as we get older. Now in men, it drops not to zero, but to levels that might start at say a thousand or so when they're 25 or 30, down to 200 or less when guys are in their 60s or 70s. And in women, often testosterone can be unmeasurable. Uh, for example, I've told you before that my testosterone was zero when I was 45, but quite commonly we do make a little bit of testosterone from our ovaries after menopause, albeit that is a small amount. So another interesting thing about estradiol is that it's not primarily produced just as it is. It's actually metabolized from a precursor hormone, and these are all really long names, but it happens to be called androstenedione. So that particular hormone is metabolized into a different type of estrogen called estrone, and then finally into estradiol, or through a different pathway, that same base hormone is metabolized into testosterone, which is then metabolized into estradiol. So actually, testosterone is the hormone that comes first in that pathway, and estradiol comes from aromatization of testosterone, which is what we call that process of conversion of testosterone into estradiol, or from that other hormone called estrone. It's quite fascinating, isn't it, that testosterone is actually produced before estradiol, even in women. So the idea that testosterone is not important for women is baloney. <laughs> it's been the most important hormone throughout our lives. And as it drops, not coincidentally, a lot of health issues start to set in. And not to say that dropping in testosterone, or estradiol for that matter, is responsible for everything to do with aging. Of course, it's not, and that's a very complex picture. But one of the things that leads to many health issues as we age is lowering hormones, both testosterone and estradiol. And we talk so much about estradiol, but let's talk a little bit more about testosterone, because there are some really exciting new newish ideas that are becoming more widely circulated in the scientific literature about the important benefits of supplementing testosterone when it drops as we get older and the many benefits that we can get from that. So 
You guys all know that I take testosterone myself. I've talked about it a lot. I actually use a testosterone pellet. And for quite some many years, there's been research suggesting that testosterone, particularly in pellet form, and I'll tell you why in a minute, lowers the incidence of breast cancer. So this research was largely spearheaded by a fantastic breast oncologist. Uh, her name is Rebecca Glazer. I've talked about her here before. We'll put a link to her website below if you wanna check out all of the research that supports what I'm talking about. But as a breast oncologist, she used testosterone in breast cancer patients and saw not only a reduction in the recurrence of their breast cancer, but also saw a resolution of their menopause symptoms without taking estrogen, because of course, some breast cancer patients are advised not to take estrogen, at least during the duration of the time that they're being treated. So her patients in a series of studies taking testosterone only with no estradiol, 85% of them saw a resolution in menopause symptoms. So Absolutely, testosterone only can be an option for some people, especially if estradiol is not recommended as an option. And if you're a breast cancer patient in particular, frequently we're told you cannot take any hormones. And that's just a misunderstanding of the science. For sure, if you've got an estrogen receptor positive breast cancer that's actively being treated, it's wise to avoid estradiol, at least for a short time. But testosterone is not only safe, but it reduces the risk of breast cancer recurrence. In fact, some of the studies have shown that tamoxifen, which is an anti-estrogen drug frequently given to breast cancer patients to reduce the risk of recurrence, doesn't work as well as testosterone. Testosterone works a lot better than tamoxifen for reducing breast cancer recurrence. And not only that, tamoxifen's got a whole bunch of awful side effects, hot flashes, night sweats, vaginal dryness, whereas testosterone got rid of those side effects. So if I have breast cancer and I choose to stop taking estrogen, which is a question, I may continue to still take it, I for sure will not stop my testosterone because not only does it help you feel better, but it reduces the incidence of breast cancer recurrence, which is really fascinating, isn't it? It's such a 180 from what we were taught 20 years ago, hormones cause breast cancer. Well, that's a very high level statement that we've talked about before. There's actually no evidence that estrogen even causes breast cancer in the biggest study ever done on hormone replacement that we all know about back from 2002. But not only that, we can reduce breast cancer incidence with testosterone. Now, if you're really worried about estradiol being a problem for stimulating breast cancer, you can actually put anastrozole, which is another anti-estrogen, in the testosterone pellet. So we have pellets in our office that have anastrozole in them, and that will block any estradiol whatsoever. It actually stops that conversion of testosterone into estradiol. So then you don't have to worry about anything. <laughs> so it's arguable whether you need that or not, frankly, but if you are really worried about that, that is an option. So, so lots and lots of studies on patients with existing breast cancer, and there are also studies on patients who have never had breast cancer. There's a really interesting study called the Dayton study, which was done in Dayton, Ohio, hence the name, showed a 70% reduction in breast cancer for patients who haven't had it yet compared to the general population if they took testosterone. And now I was talking about testosterone pellets rather than other forms of testosterone, like perhaps a cream or a trochee that can dissolve in your mouth. The reason that testosterone pellets are often used in these studies is because they're much more reliable and get much more stable levels from patient to patient and throughout the day. So if you were doing a study on testosterone cream, for example, it'd be really difficult to match it up patient to patient because there's so many variables that affect testosterone or any cream, frankly, absorption. So any type of hormone cream is going to have tons of variability in the way that it's absorbed, depending on your skin, the temperature, whether you worked out, what clothing you wear, all kinds of things, the compounding pharmacy itself, how accurately you measured it. I mean, there's just a, a million things that can change what our body is seeing when we use a cream. But hormone pellets are a lot more reliable in that way that you're getting a slow, even steady amount. So amazing that we can now say with certainty that testosterone given as replacement, especially to perimenopausal and postmenopausal patients, 
decreases the incidence of breast cancer. And if you've already had breast cancer, it will decrease the chance that you'll have a recurrence, which is pretty darn exciting because it also makes you feel really good. <laughs> Whereas all of the other treatments that we have make you feel terrible. So you can kind of have your cake and eat it too in that respect. So breast cancer, I mentioned first, because whenever we're talking about hormone replacement, no matter how many times we talk about how the Women's Health Initiative was misunderstood and misreported, the most common question is always, don't hormones cause breast cancer? I mean, we just cannot get that out of our minds. It's been so deeply ingrained. So in this case, without a doubt, tons of research to support what I'm telling you. Testosterone reduces the incidence of breast cancer, and it does not increase the risk of any other cancers. So if it's given in the appropriate doses, which of course it should be, and if you come and see me, it would be, you won't have oily skin, acne, hair loss, any of those things that you might have heard of, because we don't want our testosterone to be too high. We're trying to simulate what it was when we were young and at our most healthy. So that's a really interesting piece of information, isn't it? And then other benefits from testosterone that are equally exciting. We know that testosterone is a really powerful bone protector. So as we get older and we lose our hormones, we start to accelerate bone loss, which can ultimately lead to osteoporosis. We don't want that. We get a hip fracture, end up in a wheelchair, all kinds of bad things happen. So anything that can improve our bone density safely is a really good idea to consider. So we talk about estrogen all the time, and estrogen is really great uh, for slowing down the process of bone loss or even halting it. I mentioned on a previous video that my personal bone density test has actually improved over the past three years for no reason other than hormones because my genetics would 100% have been leading me to osteoporosis. So estradiol is great for bone protection, as is testosterone. Both together are even better than either one alone. Plus, of course, calcium, magnesium, vitamin D. So testosterone is fantastic for protecting our bones. Both estradiol and testosterone work by slowing down the cells that chew up our bone and accelerating the work of the ones who build bone. So there are two different kinds of cells, more than two, but two that we're talking about right now, in our bones. And our bones is, are living organisms that are constantly being remodeled. So we want the bone builders to at least be stable with those cells that are breaking down old bone. Because osteoporosis happens when the bone breaker downers work faster than the bone builders. Make sense? So both of those hormones have a very positive effect on bone density, which is great, because if we're gonna live to be 100, we've got to keep our bones nice and strong. So another benefit is cardiovascular protection. There are so many studies showing that testosterone is beneficial for the heart both for men and women. And there's an interesting history around this where many doctors still say, I've heard it as of even today, that a doctor said that testosterone is bad for your heart. It'll increase your risk of heart attack or something of that nature, which is just not true. Some of that came about because of an idea, sounded like it made sense, that men have more heart attacks than women. So therefore it must be testosterone that is the risk factor for heart attack. Well, that's an example of two things happening at the same time, but not being causative. So in science, we should never just take two things and put them together and assume that one caused the other. What's actually true is that in both men and women, when our testosterone drops, our risk of heart disease goes up. So as men develop low testosterone, they have a higher incidence of cardiovascular disease. And when their testosterone is replaced, that risk goes down. And the same thing happens for women. So it's really interesting that that was just a misconception, a misunderstanding of something that sounded like it made sense, that testosterone caused heart disease, but it's actually the reduction in testosterone that's associated with heart disease, along with multiple other factors, of course, but that's one of them. So estradiol, as we've talked about before, has been proven in many studies to lower the risk of heart disease. And now testosterone also does the same thing. So both together are synergistic or work together in that way to improve our lipid panel, 
prevent plaque formation, improve the quality of our blood vessels, so reduces our risk of dying from heart disease, which is the number one killer of both men and women. So if we live long enough, which we plan to, we want to do everything we can to avoid that. So if your doctor tells you that they learned in med school that testosterone causes heart disease, they're just repeating old information and it's not their fault. It wasn't my fault either before I knew this. I only knew what I knew, but that is a common misconception. However, tons of data to support what I'm saying. There's a really good book if you want to get all sciencey and check my facts. I really like this book written by Dr. Charles Mock. You can get it on Amazon. We'll put a link to it below. It's called Testosterone, Strong Enough for a Man, Made for a Woman. And what I like about this book is that he actually lists every article that's ever been written about testosterone and health benefit, or even some that show the opposite in the bibliography. You can check them out. You can read them all. It's a pretty powerful read if you're not convinced already by what I'm telling you, but check my facts. And he does a good job of listing them all in that book. So lots of benefits. We've talked about reduction in breast cancer. We've talked about cardiovascular protection, bone protection. And then the thing we sometimes think about first, or at least I do, is sexual improvement. So libido is very much related to testosterone. So as many of you have experienced and happened to me, my libido pretty much went away in my mid-40s, not coincidentally, at the same time that my testosterone plummeted. And as I mentioned, mine was zero. Now, many women do still make a small amount of testosterone from their ovaries or adrenal glands, even after menopause, but I wasn't making any. And I know what that felt like. I had zero sex drive. I had zero drive, period, like drive to do anything. Um, and replacing testosterone dramatically changed that. So does that work for everybody? No, it doesn't. I, some people do not have a sex drive that's so driven by testosterone, but many women do, like me and most of my patients. And every study that's ever been done on testosterone replacement for postmenopausal women has shown that testosterone works better than placebo for improving libido, which is interesting. Now, if this is all so true, how come everybody isn't recommending it? And that's something that people ask me that all the time. Well, why don't all doctors know this? And why isn't it just kind of an accepted fact that everybody should take these hormones? What well, kind of speaks to the slowness of the medical community to adopt new ideas? Now, I can say this because I'm a doctor, but I think it's true to say that doctors tend to attract a particular personality type that likes to be right about stuff. And I'm in that group, I'll just admit it. So turning around and developing a whole new idea and saying, you know what, I was wrong when I told you that before, I've learned something new. That's really difficult for a lot of people to do. And in my opinion, those people tend to congregate you know, more than average number in the physician field. <laughs> so an interesting study actually showed that when a new piece of science emerges that is proven by all of the studies to be accurate, it takes an average of 18 years for physicians to adopt a new practice. 18 years on average, that means a whole lot longer for some. And of course there are some early adopters, but it takes a long time for people to change their practice patterns. And just like in most jobs, Physicians are not often up to date on the literature, especially if it's not in their particular field, and they tend to keep quoting what they were taught years ago, even back in med school, and for sure, a lot of them are still quoting from the only study they ever heard of about hormones, which was the Women's Health Initiative, and we know now that that's not a good study to be quoting from. And they didn't even look at testosterone in that study. So there's a lot of advancement in science around hormone replacement, a lot. Like everything I know about hormone replacement was discovered in the past 20 years. So if you only read something 20 years ago, you're just not going to be up to date. So you do have to forgive your physicians a little bit if they're telling you things that are not up to date and be your own advocate. Read some of these books yourselves and get the accurate information because these are important things. Reduction in breast cancer, improvement in heart health, bone density, sexual function, that's enough just in and of itself. Um, and then all of the other things that go along with hormone replacement that we've talked about before, we live longer. <laughs> better quality of life, better relationships, better sleep, 
lots of different reasons. There's so many interesting parts to this story, and it is continuing to evolve. For example, in 2005, the North American Menopause Society, that's considered to be kind of where the buck stops as far as opinions about what's good to do in menopause and what isn't, North American Menopause Society way back in 2005 said that testosterone should be considered to improve sex drive in postmenopausal women. And that was based in lots and lots of science at that time. And gosh, in the past 18 years since then, massively more science has been added to that pile. But right around the same time, a drug company, I believe it was Procter & Gamble, presented the FDA with a proposed testosterone patch for women, and it was shut down for several reasons. One of them is because the FDA thought that sex drive for women wasn't that big of a problem. Now compare that to Viagra that got passed through the FDA in about two years, which is the fastest that any drug has ever, ever been FDA approved. Usually it takes five times that long. Uh, now, another interesting thing is they also approved a different drug called Adi, which many of you know is a pill that's offered to women to improve sexual arousal. It actually works on the brain neurotransmitters. It doesn't work very well. It's arguably not even better than placebo, and it has a whole bunch of side effects. So they would approve that rather than a natural hormone, which really speaks to a lot of just slowness in the way we approach things, even at the level of the FDA, and frankly, quite a bit of sexism because you know male sexual wellness is treated as something incredibly important where female sexual wellness is not really important enough to bother looking into getting a new drug FDA approved. So arguably testosterone's not even a drug, it's a natural hormone, so shouldn't even fall under that category. But there's so much interesting nonsensical stuff that's going on in that arena that we just have to kind of step back for a moment and think sensibly. These are natural hormones that you've had your whole life. As I mentioned, you've had five to 10 times more testosterone in your body than estradiol all of these years. And when it goes away, not coincidentally, a lot of health issues start to increase and replacing those hormones can diminish the incidence of those diseases and make us feel better. So makes a lot of sense to me. And if you want to check my facts, I do recommend that you read that book. Check out Dr. Rebecca Glazer's website below. I hope you enjoyed this episode. If you did, please don't forget to subscribe, share it with your friends, and I can't wait to see you next week.